In this lecture, I would like to introduce you to the concepts of stress, strain, and Young's modulus. So let's place ourselves in a mental picture here where we have a, a material, and that's shown here by, say, this brown bar here. Maybe it's a side view of some specimen that's under some kind of load, right? Um, and so here we're zooming in on a little section of the bar and looking at the atoms in the bar and what's going on with them, okay? So initially our atoms are sitting there in their equilibrium position and there's no real weight being pulled or load being applied to them. And so they're all happy there in their equilibrium position. Now in this next picture, we've applied a small load um, to the bar. So basically we've gripped onto the bar, we've secured the top, we've gripped onto the bottom, and we give it a tug, okay? So when that happens, we might see our bar stretch a little bit. Some small amount may be shown here as delta. Now what's happening to the atoms in our bar when this happens? Well remember, we've modeled our atoms um, as little balls connected to neighboring atoms by little springs. And the springs are supposed to model the bonds. So what would happen if we pulled on masses on springs? Well, the spring would stretch. And that's exactly what the bonds do too. Now, if we don't pull too hard so that we're not permanently deforming the material, then we're staying in the regime of what we call elastic deformation. And that means that if we release the load, that the atoms will then go back to their equilibrium positions shown here in this last drawing. Now, if we were to plot that, um, what would happen is, let's say that we plotted force versus our little delta, which is how far um, we can stretch our bonds, um, or our wire, or whatever, then you might see um, something that has a small region where we have a straight line, and that's kind of like a mass on a spring, which is called the linear or elastic regime. But if you keep pulling, you are going to start breaking bonds and, you know, permanently deforming the material. And then you might get something that looks like this green curve here, which is the nonlinear, non-elastic plastic deformation regime. So for today's lecture, we're just thinking about small loads where we pull it a little bit um, and it goes back to the way it was. So we can think of elastic as meaning reversible. And I always think of like an elastic or rubber um, piece and you pull on it and then you let go and it snaps back to its original um, position. Now, of course, a real metal, if you continue to pull, you're going to deform it and that's going to be called plastic deformation. And in a metal, which is what we've been talking about in previous lectures, what happens is um, when you have plastic deformation is that the bonds actually stretch, but these metal atoms will slip okay and they'll hop positions from one position to the next to the next and they might do that in um, what we call slip planes okay and so they shear with respect to one another and when you do that you're permanently moving those atoms those planes of atoms and so you're deforming it plastically and so if you plotted the force versus that displacement delta what you would have is you would have this straight line region which is our linear elastic and then it would plastically deform and you wouldn't have a straight line curve anymore, okay? So let's just think for now about the linear elastic regime of that stress strain curve. And let's define some variables. Now we all know that if you had a thin wire versus a really fat wire and you applied the same force to both wires, that the thin wire would break before the fat wire would break. And if you stretched it, the thin wire would stretch more than the fat wire would stretch. And that's just to do with the geometry of the object and nothing to do with the material properties. It's just, you know, it can support more because it's wider, right? So what we want to do in engineering and physics is to normalize out for the geometry of the object. So to do that, we define what's called the stress, the tensile stress, which is often symbolized by the Greek letter sigma. Now the stress here is defined as the force of tension that you're applying divided by the cross-sectional area of the object before you deform it maybe and change its shape. Okay, so this is its original cross-sectional area. Now the SI units for, for um, stress, force over area, would be newton per meter squared, which of course in SI units, one newton per meter squared is a pascal. The English units would be pounds per square inches. 
force in English units is pounds, and of course the area is usually given in inches squared. Okay, now another thing is the stress that you apply is going to cause a change in the length of the material. We'll call that change in length delta L. But if you pulled on a long object, its length would change more than a shorter object, right? And yet again, we're just trying to get at the material properties. So in materials science and engineering, rather than talk about just the change in length, they define what's known as the strain. Strain is usually symbolized by the Greek letter epsilon and is shown here. The strain is the change in length divided by the initial length of the object that you're tugging on, okay? And in this way, you're actually um, getting rid, again, of the geometry contributions to how much it might stretch and trying to normalize out for that and just looking at material properties. Now, the stress and strain are linearly proportional to one another. If you tug harder, for example, you'll have a larger stress and, as a result, a larger strain. The proportionality constant in between the stress and the strain is known as Young's modulus, which is symbolized here with a Y, although in some texts they call it an elastic modulus and use a capital E to symbolize it. Either is, you know, kind of acceptable, but we'll go with what matter and interactions does and use a Y. So we can relate the stress and strain, and this is our stress-strain equation. The stress sigma is equal to Young's modulus times the strain epsilon. And if you were to write it out in terms of all the variables, the stress is the um, tensile force F sub T divided by that cross-sectional area A, which is equal to Young's modulus times the change in length divided by the initial length. Now we can actually relate the modulus to the spring constant that we developed in a previous lecture for a single bond. So here we have sigma is equal to F over A, which is equal to Y times epsilon, which is equal to Y times delta L over L. If I just take F sub T over A is equal to Y delta L over L and solve for Y, I end up with the force of tension um, or the tensile force times the initial length divided by the area divided by the change in length is equal to my Young's modulus. Now remember, the tensile force or the um, force of tension, we're approximating that as being due to a spring, right? This is how we modeled it in previous lectures. And if you haven't done that already, you should watch those lectures, okay? But Hooke's Law says that if you pull on a spring, that the force um, is equal to the spring constant K times the displacement of that spring from equilibrium. So if we're modeling our object as a spring, right, then we can plug in for that. So putting F sub T is equal to K times delta L, my Young's modulus would now equal to K delta L times the initial length divided by the initial area divided by delta L again. The delta L's cancel out, and that leaves my Young's modulus is equal to K times the initial length divided by my area, okay? And so this relates the Young's modulus to the effective spring constant for my object. Now, if we think about um, what would be happening on the atomic level, like looking at, for example, just one bond um, and what's going on with that, then we can plug in for D, with D being the interatomic spacing, and the Young's modulus would then be KD over D squared, which would be equal to K over D. Now, Young's modulus for copper is, uh, well, varies a little bit depending on which alloy you're looking at, but I found a value of about 117 gigapascals, um, which is 117 times 10 to the ninth newtons per meter squared for the Young's modulus of copper. If I plug in for that, and then also plug in for the interatomic spacing of copper, which as we discussed in previous lectures, is 0.254 nanometers, then I can solve for the spring constant of copper. I would just, uh, of a copper bond, I could just multiply D times Y, which would give me 117 uh, gigapascals times 0.254 nanometers. And that would give me a spring constant, an effective spring constant of about 29.7 newtons per meter. Now, if you watch the previous lectures, then you know that's actually really close to what we developed before with our other little simple calculation. And so, in other words, the spring constant for a copper um, bond, a copper-copper bond, is roughly 30 newtons per meter. So, um, nice prediction, right?
Now, what would happen in real material science is that you have something called a ten typical tensile testing machine here. We have one of these at Appalachian, used for our material science labs and classes. And what you do is you stick your specimen in between some clamps, and you can apply a load and uh, to it, um, to your specimen, and then measure how much your specimen stretches under that load. And that gives you um, your uh, sigma is equal to y epsilon bit, and you can measure your um, Young's modulus of your material, okay? We do this in material science all the time. So let's do an example problem for this. Let's say that you have a cylindrical specimen of some kind of titanium alloy, and it has an elastic modulus of 107 gigapascals and an original diameter of 3.8 millimeters. So it's going to experience only elastic deformation when a tensile load of 2,000 newtons is applied. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that this is being used in some kind of you know, engineering um, part or something. And what we want is to compute the max length of the specimen before deformation if the specs for the part say that the maximum allowable elongation of that part is 0.42 millimeters. Okay, so our knowns here, it's given our diameter, which is two times our radius, so that's 3.8 millimeters. We can then from that find the cross-sectional area using the formula pi r squared, because of course it's a cylinder, so the cross-sectional area would be a circle. Our Young's modulus is given as 107 gigapascals, which is 107 times 10 to the 9th pascals. The applied force is 2,000 newtons, and the elongation at that applied force is 0 0.42 millimeters. So we can use our stress-strain equation, sigma is equal to y epsilon. So here, uh, y is 107 gigapascals, so we plugged in for that, times epsilon would be equal to my stress. And my stress would be my force divided by my area, which is 2,000 newtons divided by pi r squared, which is pi times 1.9 millimeters squared. So solving then for my um, stress sigma, I get 1.76 times 10 to the 8 pascals there on the right-hand side of my equation. Now, dividing that uh, 1.76 times 10 to the 8 pascals by Young's modulus, 107 times 10 to the 9 pascals, I get my engineering strain. The strain epsilon is 0 0.00165, and that would be equal to delta L over the initial length. So the delta L given was 0.42 millimeters, and then you divide out by the initial length, Solving for the length, we will cross multiply, and the length I found was 255 millimeters, or 0 0.255 meters. So that would be the max allowable bit there um, if I only want to have that amount of strain. Okay, well, um, I hope that simple example helped solidify some things in your head. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and as always, I'll see you in class.